Face to face with Mariam Gunvujaya. A very good evening. You're watching yet another edition of the Face to Face on TV One, where we dive deeper into Sri Lanka's political arena. And today, to discuss a lot that is happening in the country, we have Professor Anil Jayantha. He is an Economic Council member of the National People's Power. A very good evening to you, Professor Jayantha, and welcome on the show. Thank you. Very good evening to you too. All right. Um, I think the 2024 budget and several significant changes in this particular budget has been the talk of the town. And um, I'd like to start off by touching on the wet hike that was, I think, a very significant change in this particular budget. How do you think this budget proposal to increase um, wet to 18% will have a potential impact on inflation and the cost of living for ordinary people, Professor Chanta? Of course, Mariam, so there are lots of implications. Um, the idea behind why the VAT has been increased from 15 to 18 percent may be directly to increase the tax revenue. Um, it is pretty obvious compared to 2023, uh, ex estimated um, tax revenue from VAT in 2024 uh, is 1,400 uh, billion. So that is an increase of 105 percent. So VAT is a tax, indirect tax, imposed or levied on the final consumption. So that would be easy uh, for a government, but from technical point of view as well, uh, VAT is not a bad tax because that is charged on the consumption and collected at different stages where the value is created. But the problem here is the, uh, there are several problems. Uh, the this much high rate, the 18% is too much if you just take uh, look around the other countries as well. This is too much. For example, like even if you go to developed countries, basically this VAT rate is 5%, 6% likewise. On average, world benchmark is considered to be 15% or something like So we have increased it. So direct impact is that the purchasing power of the ordinary people across the country goes down then they would be denied to access very essential. As of now, we, it's a fact that people are really highly pressurized. They are uh, very hard to find the means of living. In such a situation, when you increase the VAT, the prices go up, you have to bear the price, then you can access to very limited number of products. So it is not good for, because we need to have a quality life that is denied on the one hand. Indirectly, what happens in the long run, within maybe a couple of months, six, whatever, so it takes time, when the purchasing power, what we call the aggregate demand, goes down, it will have a negative impact in the economy as well because producers, especially the small and medium um, sector uh, the entrepreneurs, when they produce goods according to their capacity, they come to the market and try to sell the goods. But on the other hand, people do not have adequate purchasing capacity. So this would further drag our economy to a contraction that is so dangerous. and. Other areas, like it is not mere increasing the rate. Uh, when we impose taxation, there are certain goods, essential goods, uh, in other countries, they are either uh, at zero tax rate or very low tax rate. But here, lots of items which were previously exempted have been then now removed. Like if strategically, now government says this is the list of our exemption. Actually, this is the reduced list of exemption. Earlier, um, more than 100. 20 items were exempted, now only 40 something. So when you go through the list of items which were previously exempted, now removed from the exemption are highly essential things. Even in go to industry, education, everywhere, so you have to pay high price. So therefore, there are lots of negative consequences on this thing. People would um, find very hard to make their living. Now, Professor Jayantha, uh, apart from your economic expertise, you represent a certain political party, that's the National People's Power, exactly. where you are part of the uh, economic committee. Yeah. Now, um, what do you think the NPP would have done different to have alternate reforms when it comes to the budgeting system or even the financial system, because you just mentioned about the VAT? Apart from um, increasing taxes and just uh, reducing exemptions, what would you all do different if that was the case? Of course, so it has to be cleared like this. Um, hmm. Actually, uh, for a government, taxation is not a bad thing, so we need to have a tax. Um, when under NPP government, we have to collect 
adequate tax revenue because we do not have any other uh, income mainly uh, the government revenue comes from taxation so we have to uh, make it very efficient the tax collection tax administration and um, even the uh, increase of tax uh, base and there are lots of um, frauds corruption and even tax evasion those kind of things are there with certain reasons and under NPP government technically we have to um, the clear off all those things and make it to a very efficient system there are lots of uh, the things to be done uh, among them one of the major driver is the technology through technology we can link and in expand the tax base and implement a fair tax system so that tax should should be fair that is number thing. so that is uh, some some may look at okay how are we going to increase the tax of course with the present economic base mm -hmm. if we try hard and try, uh, the, uh, the try to find means and ways of increasing tax it's difficult you can't uh, have adequate uh, government revenue therefore essentially you need to go for a kind of economic uh, plan uh, direction to expand your economy these tax policies are rather destructive even though you increase your tax rate expecting that you can go for high tax rate no in turn the tax revenue will go down because the, when the tax is very high people will they are also smart in a way they will find other means of evading this tax that is bad under our government our tax policy is very transparent even IMF has a fiscal transparency code we would ready to just because people uh, have a right of knowing what where our money goes so do you have concerns when it comes to transparency and accountability of the budgeting system of this government um, so in a way as as of this government like so no matter which government is this hmm. uh, transparency really matters hmm. but within this government we know that uh, the present system how corruption has really encroached into system so we can't expect uh, such a, a transparency what i am just referring is hmm. transparency and all sort of things under a npp government so you you need to clear the politics uh, from top otherwise you can't expect this uh, transparency for sure and without expanding the economy uh, it is unlikely that you can increase your tax revenue to a sizable amount or adequate amount to do the required things by government for example take the tax revenue as a percentage of gdp in sri lanka that is now just less than 10 percent around 10 percent it is really bad at least you must increase it to 15 percent one research finding is there so i would like to hide when the tax revenue as a percentage of GDP is very low, it really invites for further corruption. It is proven here. If mm. you take the tax rates, now 18%, SSL, that is Social Security um, Contribution Levy, 2.5%. So indirect tax, non-indirect tax is more than 20%. If you go to the personal income tax rate, that is 36%, that's the highest uh, the, uh, the bracket. Mm. And the corporation also pay uh, 30%. When you take the rates, they are very high. That means that is charge on the income. But finally, when the government collects money, that revenue accounts for only 10%. If you apply the simple mathematics, something is wrong, right? Because you charge 36%, 20%, likewise, there are so many other taxes, I did not refer to all those things. Mm. But finally, when you take everything collected, so it is just 10%. That means there are lots of avenues, ways and means, so corruption, inefficiencies and all those things. So that is not good. We have to rectify all those things in order to run an efficient government. In a way, these systems are inviting for corruption. So you're saying that NPP government won't have any of that? No, we do not. Because that right. is what, like, when it comes to the corruption and all those things, so we, it has to be uh, cleared and clarified from the top. So we have our own policies and all those. Because without which... We can run a government, but we cannot run a government in order to uh, create an environment where people can have a quality life. So hmm. that is uh, totally different from our, like what the government does is totally different from us. Now, Professor Jayantha, I think a lot of Sri Lankans are expecting 2024 to be an election year because unfortunately yeah. this year wasn't an election year. Yeah. So uh, how do you think the 2024 budget is going to balance uh, fiscal discipline and a voter's appeal when it comes to an election year? Um, it looks like this as far as the fiscal balance is concerned. The government has a challenge. Hmm. On the one hand, of course, now the economy is in a dire situation and uh, at the same time government declared its unilateral bankruptcy in 2022 as of now either we like it or not we are really uh, in a conundrum so where imf deal is there hmm. so 
in order to get a kind of bailout, a kind of breathing, breathing space, government has to comply with all those indicators given by IMF. Mm. Among them, one is, the major one is uh, the, uh, what you call revenue-based fiscal consolidation. Mm. So therefore you have to have uh, sizable revenue and your expenses are required to be matched with the revenue. So therefore that is, that is one of the reasons why government goes like this. But with the present mechanism, uh, with the present context where the corruption are harbored, it is unlikely that the government will be able to collect that particular revenue. So that is one of the challenge. But government will find some other sources. Then what is the other alternative then? In order to go for a uh, revenue-based fiscal consolidation, you have to curtail your expenses. Even the expenses, there are lots of recurrent expenses, salaries. You can't curtail these things. Other expenses may be public expenses, education, health and other things low and or to maintain law and order, those things would be further curtailed for sure. Hmm. Even with these things, it's unlikely that government will be able to match it. So therefore, the next step is to sell off the uh, uh, the public property. So the, these are the, uh, the balance sheet that I see. Meantime, just referring to this election, hmm. government needs some more money. Like if the government is going to full curtailment of the expenses, that would be a problem. But on the other hand, IMF also has asked, okay, this is really um, a little bit painful. Hmm. You have to go for austerity measures. As a result, the people would have to bear a big pain. So there would be a, a kind of fraction in the society that they are vulnerable. Then transfer, give direct cash transfers. For the direct cash transfers, some money has been allocated. That hmm. will be there. Apart from that, I think government has very, um, I do not know how to say, strategically or shrewdly allocated 300 billion under contingent expenses votes. Compared to last year, it was just 100 billion something. This time, three times more. These contingent expenses under that particular vote code, hmm. if you want, you can interpret, because this budget has so many loopholes, you can interpret this as a contingent situation and they may try for, of course, to give bribes and then the take the votes. So it is a responsibility of the general public as well unless the government has a very clear plan of just uh, developing our economy if you just take some money as a like uh, i mean the date like a ransom and uh, if, if you compromise your civic rights for 5,000 rupees, 10,000 rupees, your future would be really in a bleak situation. That right, so really you're bad. sure that uh, we wouldn't be hearing another day where they say that we can't afford an election. We will definitely have an election next year. Um, government may think of their own different trump cards. Actually, in order to hold, we do not want that much big amount of money. Hmm. So government revenue, estimated government revenue for this year is 4,000 um, in terms of billions, 4,130 billion, hmm. of which for the election is a little amount that has been already allocated. Hmm. But we have a fear, and again, the uh, uh, um, skepticism is there because hmm. the last year they did not do yeah. that is a local authority election. So, within the given legal framework, the president and the other authorities have kind of um, passages to uh, uh, differ it. Hmm. But when it comes to the presidential election, it is not that easy because, president, how come a president itself, himself, hmm. uh, declares and decides that no need to have a whole election? Right. And on the other hand, even with some deficiencies, we have an election commission, so we have an independent election commission. Automatically, as I remember, maybe uh, somewhere mid-May, this election commission get, uh, gets the power hmm. so, uh, to hold the election because in order to hold an election, you have to have uh, a fair time frame. Yeah. So within which we'll see, because they can't say that simply, no, we are not going to hold elections of countries in a difficult situation. No, it is not possible because that is totally against the constitution, the violation of law and order. So th there would be lots of um, uh, um, consequences if they do. Therefore, I can't imagine a situation where the government would not hold the uh, presidential election. Hmm. Of course, the general election is something that uh, government has to bring in advance, yeah. because that is due in 2025. So definitely uh, within the present context and the, uh, the, the budget has already allocated, of course, they have to hold it. Now, Professor Jantha, you touched on the IMF that I would like to speak about a bit. Now, mm. IMF has uh, cleared the second tranche. Mm. That is, I think, at $337 million for yeah. Sri Lanka under the EFF. Mm. Um, can you break down to our viewers what this means uh, to an average person? What, how would this impact their life? Mm. This is this. Like, basically, um, as far as this IMF um, mm. deal, that is what we call extended fund facility program, 
IMF is there to help countries, the member countries, whenever they face difficulties. Hmm. As of now, we have borrowed a lot. Okay. So the borrowings locally, government borrowed, and externally we borrowed in dollars. Hmm. So the problem arose uh, with regard to the external borrowing. So hmm. local borrowing, of course, there is a problem. So the interest rate is very high. The interest component is also f big amount. Yeah. However, government has uh, an opportunity of uh, the printing, like refinancing by issuing new bonds and treasury hmm. bills. But when it comes to international financing, like the external financing, now government cannot go for refinancing because could not borrow. And most of the borrowed funds had been had not been utilized for effective things because you can find the uh, evidence from even audit reports and all hmm. so that finally government could not partly the covid and other things also affected foreign remittances also went down and gradually by looking at the progress of our country uh, international um, rating agencies also foresaw these things and say that so countries the situation was downgraded hmm. as a result Govern, the government did not think uh, from a holistic point of view, uh, national point of view, instead they took decision always to hold on to their power centers. Hmm. That is why they did not think of any other alternative. There were so many different alternatives when we deal with creditors. We have different types of creditors. Uh, we have borrowed from the open market. Uh, we have borrowed from uh, multilateral organization. We had borrowed from uh, the countries, uh, directly from countries, hmm. and for different purposes. Had we gone to creditors and explained our situation, why foreign exchange were deflating, if they were genuine enough, they could have done something. Finally, they were really, really des in a desperate situation and happened to declare that we were not in a position to serve our debt. That was the situation. Hmm. So th that is their own fault. They, so they, 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 they should be res held responsible for this thing. But they try to uh, institutionalize an idea that, oh no, we did not have any other alternative. That is a myth. In a way, one of the biggest mistake, if someone says that we did not have any alternative, we had lots of alternative. As of now, we have to come out from this uh, situation there is yeah. no. So then IMF is a mediator to tell us, okay, follow this particular program, hmm. then your situation would be eased off and in the future, maybe in a couple of uh, years time, you can further borrow. In Even if you borrow uh, in the future, hmm. you have to have a very good plan. But as of now, government has not shown how the economy would be revived and the production of the country would be increased. So. As far as the IMF is concerned, they do not worry about what the government is doing, but they look at only the technical points. From the technical point of view, government has to adjust its fiscal But what's balance. the benefit for the people? So there are no benefits. That's the thing. That's what I'm telling. Hmm. So it's up to the government because government should be held responsible. So now government thinks that so they, they, they articulate that this is the only solution. Therefore, we have to take these uh, tranches. So therefore, we have to pass all the burden to the ordinary people. That's the reason why VAT was increased. That is the reason why even domestic debt restructuring. Look at, so in the country there are so many people, uh, people, mm. different stratas. So we have different revenues, income. But finally, what happened under the do domestic debt restructuring? Entire burden was passed on to EPF. That's mm. bad. So even in the future, what is likely to happen is to further increase uh, prices, taxes and uh, denial of uh, 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 required services and all those things. So this is what we call austerity measures. So finally, when austerity measures are there, who suffers the most? The poor. The majority, large majority of uh, people in Sri Lanka will have to suffer a lot. But those who are responsible, that is the other part, dangerous, those who are responsible for those uh, uh, problems, uh, will not suffer. They have increased their wealth even in this uh, crisis period. That is really problematic. But Professor Janata, I think the mindset of a majority at least, mm. or let's say some people, uh, for them, last year we saw from I think every junction to junction, yeah. we see petrol queues, yeah. we see queues for gas, we see people protesting. And the mindset of some people is that is not there anymore. Mm. So, mm. you know, it's kind of some sort of civilization for them. Mm. Do you consider this progress for the economy? No, it is not a progress, just mm. what you said is correct, compared yeah. to the 
the prevailing situation mm. now keeps are not there yeah. so not having keeps or mm. just not having such a troublesome situation does not warrant that we are going on the right path mm. because what is missing is the production so even if you just go back to recall the period where there were no keeps so mm. do, do you claim that the people are living happily no they were struggling so they the actually the creation of the keeps and other things were the they are consequences of wrong economic policies right. so now they so they they uh, really uh, um how to say hide the mm. real picture of this thing and our eyes are just directed towards imf and the keeps only we need to go i mean we need to open this screen it is kind of window dressing practices just clear the uh, open the win uh, the dress and look beyond the window and see what are the real problems real problems are not the queues queues were the consequences of wrong and undemocratic economic policies so government has not shown a single sign that they are going into the right path even if you take i'll just give you one simple mm. example the couple of days go sri lanka nail i just so uh, a particular message yeah. s- uh, sent to the uh, shareholders of sri lanka nail line saying that now government has already paid 102 billion uh, actually that has been paid to settle the loan uh, to uh, ceylon petroleum corporation and that loan is going to be converted into shares of sri lanka nail line sri lanka nail line has a huge loss of more than 600 billions Hmm. So, so they're just blindsiding the people. Yeah. So in a way, this money, so 102 billion is the people's money collected from taxes. Hmm. Hmm. So what is the right of the government to give that money to Sri Lanka Airline in a like uh, uh, situation? They are trying to sell this off. The pressure may have come from creditors. Okay, your loss is too much. Hmm. So why don't you clear the balance sheet for us? So. if a government has a very good strategy government should come forward and tell us how best they are going to revive and restructure state owned enterprises it is not mere selling off so they want to sell these things hmm. and secure their powers in the government that is what it's really bad you right. can see uh, get the more details of this particular transaction uh, in this particular transaction they are trying to achieve two objectives one is to clear the balance sheet of uh, sri lankan airline and sell it and at the same time silon petroleum op- uh, petroleum corporation had the due from sri lankan airline that also obtained so in a way balance sheet of the sri lankan petroleum corporation is also bit cleared how with the money of the general public mm. if that money has been given from those who are responsible it's okay right. so now so that is why i'm telling even in a such a difficult situation this government doesn't show a single evidence that they are going on the right path all the burden are passed on to the general public it's mm. bad that is why i'm saying that Uh, this is not the right way i would like to touch back on the election uh, part yeah, of it no. um you uh, spoke about the economic condition now but uh, professor jayanta how do you think an eco- the economic condition um, impacts the voters behavior when it comes to elections and mm. how would an outcome of an election uh, impact the economic policy of a country if you would like to elaborate on oh yeah it's in a way like uh, interconnected yeah, and it yeah. has to be further elaborated um Uh, um i feel like nowadays so we just interact with the different um, strata of the society mm. poor people villages even business communities yeah. and all now to great extent general people like people have understood that among the other problems of why we are here and are facing such a uh, difficult situation mm. number one is the corruption and the bad governance so therefore that is there so uh, like um, that they have a feeling and general sentiment that those who rule the country and ruling the country should be held responsible so therefore their reaction is more likely to chase them maybe actually with this uh, the corrupt regime it is difficult to think of economic revival i think that as in the past uh, government uh, govern all the governments were really in a way uh, were able to deceive the general public i think that this time it would not be dis- i mean uh, possible hmm. to great extent i don't say that the general public are fully uh, political conscious but to great extent they know in and outs and where where the wrong things are there so therefore they would react hmm. but we should not forget the fact that on the other hand those corrupt regime those who get profits and create uh, immense wealth uh, in billions trillions of money will not give up this opportunity they also try hard to deceive this so it's it would be a kind of battle hmm. so uh, from political point of view this particular election from all the uh, surveys and uh, analysis even from the government side independent so hmm. clear message has been their government would lose its power it's more likely that it would shift 
So this is what we are preparing our program and showing that this is how it should be really saved, economy should be saved and how the life of the pe lives of the people should be protected. Uh, this this would be a battle, but we'll see how people would react. Our responsibility is to make the general public aware that if you follow the wrong policies, this mm. would be the consequences. Actually, we are in a particular junction. Juncture. This particular juncture have only two ways. One is for the um, uh, destruction. Mm. Other one is to create a kind of platform for the prosperity, common prosperity. We are working towards that. Right, and let's just hope that the people choose wise this time. Uh, we'll have to cut our discussion short on the budget. Mm -hmm. We've got uh, ballots and bailouts. That was our discussion uh, with uh, Professor Anil Jayantha, National People's Power Economic uh, Council member. Thank you very much for being with us, uh, Professor Jayantha. It was my great pleasure, Mariam. Uh, so thank you so much. And that's a wrap of Face to Face for today. Thank you for watching. Good night and take care. Oh! <laughs>